And my favorite wife. <laughs> you have more than one? Only one. Bonnie, she's been stuck with me for 54 years. Wow. And a bunch of kids. And so we're just, we're from Draper, but we all, we are blessed to have this place. And next to Freedom Ranch, are a bunch of great people that we love. And in fact, it's here. So we're, we're sort of want to be preppers and want to be San Pete. Right. San Peter's. San Peter's. <laughs> so we're, working, we're working on it. And uh, Ben Kelly at the Freedom Ranch asked if we could put up the door. It's really great to know some neighbors and friends. And we'd like to get to know you better. And, and Brother Phil Pot, I don't really know, although we had some legal work together. We did, yeah. And don't hold it against him. He's a lawyer, too. But well, we're, we're both on the path of repentance. Yeah, we both we both won in that one. <laughs> we both won that case, he says. <laughs> anyway, so I'll let this is your event, Dave Cully. Come on up here. By the way, bathrooms. We have one right there. There's one down the hall. A couple downstairs. Welcome to walk around and check out our pad. And we have some refreshments. What do you think we should have those after? Well, we could start with them. Um, well, maybe, we'll, I don't know. I'm not good at it. Yeah, we're going to have to. Yeah. Anyway, thank you all for coming. We, we love this country and we love San Jose County. I'm a, a former Marine and Vietnam veteran, so I really am grateful for this country. What it stands for. I'm really anxious to hear how you're going to fix it. <laughs> it was inside of the Alright, we're excited to have Morgan Silva here tonight. He's a former former talk show host. And uh, yeah, he was on the Tape House Radio heard him many years ago. A long time ago. And uh overall rabble rouser. And he's going to be talking about the prophecies of Ezra's Eagles, secret combinations. He does a really good timeline on the, the Book of Mormon and the Bible on the second coming of our Savior, which, which will be really interesting. He also talks about the founding fathers and how how they knew that they were setting up a government for a, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with that said, I'll ask Mike Eor to come up and say the opening prayer. <coughs> <clears throat> Our kind and loving Father in heaven, we are truly grateful for this country of which we are citizens of, for the freedoms that <clears throat> have afforded us the lifestyles that we all enjoy. We ask for thy spirit to be here with us, that Morgan's mind may be clear, that his tongue may be loosed, and that our minds will be quickened to be able to take in all that he has to offer and then go to our homes and make a difference. This we pray for in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. How many have seen any one of my presentations before? Who has not? Who has no idea who I am? Okay. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> so if this is slow and boring, you know who to blame, right? I'm just kidding. I, it's going to be boring, but I'll try not to make it. Well, it'll be slow too. I promise it will be slow and boring. Unless you're really interested, then it won't be boring. Okay. I, uh, I wasn't going to talk about this right off, but I think I'm going to. I, I served an internship in like 1997 in Washington, D.C. with Bill Clinton. 
all right, and Al Gore. I was actually at the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and it was that experience that caused me to become a Republican. And I became a Republican because after being there, I knew I wasn't a Democrat, but that was about all that my brain could process at that age. So I came back to Utah, joined the Republican Party. I ran for the Utah legislature, and I served two terms in the Utah House. And then I took off to law school back in Michigan at a place called Ave Maria, which was a little conservative constitutionalist Catholic law school. Well, ever since that time, I have pondered why politics never seems to work. It, it doesn't. I mean, you may find independent localized success, and I don't mean localized as in Mount Pleasant, you could find it there too. You could find localized success in a county, in a state, and occasionally you could even get, you know, and uh, for libertarians, they loved Ron Paul. For Republicans, uh, we were really happy we elected Mike Lee. Some were not, right? So even there, right, success can be found in conservative circles, moderate circles, liberal circles. And I used to wonder how how do you make sense of that, right? Because if I go to the Book of Mormon or the Bible, there is no Republican. There is no Democrat. You cannot even find the word politics in the scriptures. Now, how is that possible? Any guesses? How can you not have the word politics in the scriptures? It doesn't make sense unless the word didn't exist when Joseph was translating the Book of Mormon, or maybe God told all the prophets, don't use that word. Now, does anybody know what language the Bible and the Book of Mormon are in? King James Version, 16th century English. So if we were to look at 16th century English, does 16th century English contain the word politics? Yeah, it's there. It's in Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which is really a dictionary based upon 16th century English, modernized for a then uh, modern nation, the United States of America, relatively new in that time. And Noah Webster had said that he was inspired by God to create a dictionary of the American language, and he based it on biblical language. And in it, you will find the word politics. So I, I wondered my entire life, and, and one thing that spurred this kind of wondering was I was in the Utah House lounge where legislators can go and relax and meet with lobbyists and make secret deals, you know, behind the place where they vote. And President Faust came in to give a prayer one day, and he was invited there by the leader of the Democrat Party because President Faust had been a... Democrat. And that was a little disappointing to me at the time, but he was in the first presidency. So I was like, well, you know, maybe he repented. And so here comes Elder Faust and the leader of the Democrat party reaches out, shakes his hand, says, Elder Faust or President Faust, I understand you used to be a Democrat. He really said that right in front of me. Now I'm, I'm like 28, 29 years old at the time. <laughs> And I'm thinking, oh, man, what's he going to say to that? And I wanted to jump in right there and say, he said, well, so first he says, I have risen above such things. And I almost said, so you became a Republican. <laughs> I didn't, right? Because I was too scared to joke around with an apostle of the Lord. And, but I wondered, what does that mean? <coughs> so let me show you something. I just got back from Washington, D.C., and we were talking to members of Congress and their staff about problems surrounding the weaponization of the United States government against American citizens for their political views and political actions, which prior to, you know, 20 years ago, prior to the arrival of the Patriot Act and the modern war on terrorism, which moved into the United States in the form of domestic terrorism, prior to that, you know, we just didn't really see the weaponization of the United States government against its own citizens. Now, I was sitting in a meeting with one of the staffers and I said, do you know where most of America's terrorism is being bred? You know what he said? The West. The West, right here. 
Now, how many of you believe that? You believe that most domestic terrorism is growing in Utah? California. California. Can you think of one domestic terrorist incident in California? Can you think of one domestic terrorist incident in Oregon or Washington? Yeah, and, but not prosecuted, right? Guess where the prosecutions have happened? And the uh, operations against people. Ruby Ridge, where's that? Okay, um, Waco, Oklahoma City, understandably. That one's a little bit different. I don't put that in the same category. Dr. Red in southern Utah. And the Bundys, Nevada, Utah. So how many of you know that domestic terrorism is not growing in Utah? I know that's not true. Okay, I know it. It's not happening here. I think, yeah, but isn't it? It's growing within our government, though. Everything they do is terrorist acts. Okay. So now this, this kind of leads to the second pondering I had is why don't you, you know, for those of you who are Mormons, I am. I'm unabashedly LDS. My presentation will be unabashedly LDS. And uh, I've always thought it was weird that we use this term called secret combinations. That's a weird term, right? So when you talk to somebody who's not LDS and you're like, oh, I really hate those secret combinations in Washington, D.C., they can kind of get what you mean, right? But why didn't Joseph, again, in his translation of the Book of Mormon, like the word politics, why didn't he use organized crime? Wouldn't that be easier to understand for our day? What would be the problem with Joseph using the phrase organized crime in the Book of Mormon? The behavior of the Gadiantans at a certain point in time in Helaman, remember when it says they uh, obtained soul management of the government? And then the secret combination moves into the government, and it says they obtain soul management of the government. They overspread even the righteous, it says, in the book of Ether. And then it's no longer criminal. So you can't call it organized crime because it's not crime. Right? It has to be against the law. Yeah, it has to be against the law to be criminal. So this shows Joseph's foresight and prophetic standing. He didn't use that term. He used the term secret combinations because what's happening in Washington, D.C., and tell me now if you agree, this is what I'm getting at. This is the pondering I had for so long. Why use that word? Okay, look at verse 16. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, which, but, but he at least had the choice to try and change it, right? Say that's a weird word. Uh, well, no, I, I agree. That's an argument regarding the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, which I'm, I don't even feel the need to argue. I believe that completely. Okay, look at this. What's the purpose of a secret combination? To administer the oaths to who? How would you do that? Education, schools, culture, practices in government. Now, look, what is, wh why would you administer these oaths to the people? Because they're created for what purpose? Darkness. Keep the people in darkness and to help who? Those okay, now that is American politics from the bottom to the top. If you don't want power, you're not going to win. And if you win, you are an anomaly. But when you go to Washington, D.C. or the halls of your local government, guess what you're going to find? People who do things they do because if they don't do them, they will lose power. Most of them think they're virtuous and doing good things. Most of them are your neighbors your ward members, your friends. But they live in a system that is dedicated and orchestrated to rewarding people who seek and retain power. Has anybody studied economics? What happens when you incentivize something? 
more you get more of it. So from the bottom to the top, our entire system now, and, and you can study the history of this going all the way back to the early 1900s, post-Civil War, America fundamentally changes and by the 1920s, we've embraced a concept, which I'm not going to go into tonight, called regionalization or marble cake federalism through a commission, one of which is called the Brownlow Commission and people like Charles Merriam. Okay? And they're going to dedicate themselves to penetrating the, the barriers that the Constitution set up to restraining growth of power outside the bounds of the Constitution until you get to a point today where we have things like the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, the Utah Association of Counties, the League of Cities and Towns, the National Governors Association, and guess what these things do? They transcend boundaries such that now we even have interlocal or cross-boundary cooperative agreements being entered into by your government, city, county, state that transcend the Constitution and contract us outside the bounds of the Constitution. Okay, so here we are. You live in that time. Now, I'm going to show you tonight, I hope, that all the scriptures point to your day right now and beg for you to wake up and see this. Because being a Latter-day Saint is not about being nice. It was never intended to create nice people. It was intended to create sanctified, holy people who serve the Lord day and night. Okay, now let's jump over here. This is a quote by President Nelson in 2018. He says, brethren, will you please remain standing? And join with our chorus in singing all three verses of Rise Up, O Men of God. While you sing, think of your duty as God's mighty army to help prepare the world for the second coming of the Lord. This is our charge. This is our privilege. Here's the verses. I'm not going to read them to you. It's an amazing song. It is a clarion call to the men of our day to stop being small-minded, small-hearted, and small in spirit, and to stand up and be who you were meant to be in the kingdom of God. He will then say in April of 2018, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. You've all heard these, right? You remember this? Some of these have made the rounds everywhere. Increase your spiritual capacity to receive revelation. That's April 2018. What's going to happen two years later? COVID. In October 2018, in an interview with Elder Stevenson in Chile, he says the Lord will hasten his work in his time. If you think the church has been fully restored, you're just seeing the beginning. Wait till next year. That would be 2019. And the next year, that would be 2020. Eat your vitamin pills. Notice what he didn't say. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> you fill in the blank there. He then says in October, I bless with the ability, you with the ability to leave the world behind to prepare the world for the second coming of his beloved son. You won't find a single talk by President Nelson since 2018 when he assumed the presidency of the church where he doesn't either talk about the second coming or the gathering of Israel. Both of those second coming prophetic markers from the scriptures. April 2019, time is running out, he says. Now, I actually saw somebody post a meme the other day on Facebook, I think it was, where they quoted him in 2005 or 2008 saying, now is the time to prepare, time is running out. 2018, he changed it, just said time is running out. April 2019, one year before the big event, he's in Rome, Italy, and says this is a hinge point. Things are going to move forward at an accelerated pace. One year later, in that same location, what will happen? The hardest hit place in the world, first, really, is Rome, Italy. 
October 2020, how have current events made you feel about the future? The Lord has spoken of our day in sobering terms. He warned that in our day, men's hearts would fail them. Okay, notice the footnote. This is actually in the talk. And that even the very elect would be at risk of being deceived. Okay, October 2020, the footnote number two will take you in his talk to DNC 4526. We're going to look at that. He would repeat the same admonition in April of 2021. We live in a time prophesied long ago when all things shall be in commotion and surely men's hearts shall fail them for fear shall come upon all people. That was true before the pandemic and it will be true after. Commotion in the world will continue to increase. Now, footnote two, here it is. DNC 4525. But they shall be gathered again, but they shall remain until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And in that day, what day? In the time in which the Gentiles are fulfilled. So if you think of a full, well, we'll come back. Let me come back to that. In that day is when the whole earth shall be in commotion and men's hearts shall fail them. Now, why is that important? What is DNC 45 about? It is the second coming. In fact, the Lord says to Joseph, I'm going to tell you what I said to my apostles on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24. One of the most important scriptures that we have. So important, Joseph and the Lord will not just give us DNC 45. Joseph will give us the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 1, it's called, which will contain, I think, parts of, the, of Matthew 23 and a lot of, of Matthew 24. So we now have three sources for Matthew 24. Matthew 24, Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 1, it's called, it's actually titled Matthew 1, and DNC 45. Three different ways, three different perspectives to see Matthew 24. And President Nelson is footnoting that and saying, you live right now in that time, placing you squarely in the chronology of the second coming. All right, guess what follows after commotion and men's hearts failing them? The chapter will speak about the times of the Gentiles coming to a fulfillment or a completion. Then it says, they the remnant shall remain until the times be fulfilled. And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be men standing in that generation. You see what's happening? Once you hit that moment, he continues to say, those same people will see this and this and this in that generation. What else will we see? That generation shall not, uh, there shall be men standing in that generation that shall not pass until they see an overflowing scourge, for a desolating sickness shall cover the land. Now, let me show you something real quick. We're going to jump out here to the scriptures. The, the modern online scriptures have an amazing tool. If you go to the search feature and you put in desolating in quotes, which I'm going to do right now. You do a search. You can narrow using your tab right here. See the collections tab? All you got to do is select that tab. It will create a pop-up menu, and you can select only the scriptures to see that word only in the scriptures, and you don't get all the other talks. You can even narrow that down to a book. So, for example, we can see that desolating does not appear in the Old Testament does not appear in the New Testament, does not appear in the Book of Mormon, but appears in the Doctrine and Covenants in DNC 5 and DNC 45. So let's take a look at this. Let's try desolation. One of the tricks in Hebrew studies is when you see a word, go to the original word in the scriptures to see if you can discern the meaning that God first placed upon that term. Now when we look at it, Let's see. Let me let me do this. Yeah. 
you used to be able to do an, an even more amazing uh, search. They used to allow what's called Boolean phrases. You can't do them anymore. It's kind of a bummer, but you could look for any word that contained desolate in it. So we're going to look at desolate. Okay, there we go. See the first appearance? Ever. The first appearance ever of the word desolate, desolating, desolation is Genesis 47. In the story of the fat kind, the lean kind, the good and withered stocks. Why would that be important? How many of you are old enough to remember President Hinckley's talk in conference in 2001 after the Twin Towers fell? And he said, I cannot help but think of the lesson of the fat and the lean kind. That was 2001. How many cycles do we have? Fat kind, lean kind, good stocks, withered stocks, each being how many years apiece? Seven times four is? 2001 plus 28 is? 2029. That's interesting because in 2020, they told us what about 2029? Great Reset. You can read about it online. You can, go, you can go on the internet and you can read about it. You can go to the World Economic Forum's own website to read about the Great Reset plan for 2029. Now, why would they do that? How many of you, how many of you have ever heard of the G7 countries? Okay, the G7 countries are the most powerful countries in the world. They control the world dollar, right? They control the world economy. They create the greatest world domestic product until when? Until 2022, BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, surpassed the G7 countries, overtaking them in the competition for the largest portion of the world's gross domestic product. So what do we call that? What do we call it when two competing entities go to war in the economy? It's a Cold War. So remember Reagan? Who won the Cold War? We did. What did Russia do once we won the Cold War? They collapsed. So you have a choice. At the end of a Cold War, you can either declare bankruptcy and collapse your economy, or you can... Choose not to, not to concede and go to war. Well, we just lost the Cold War in 2022. And for the first time in modern history, another entity now controls the world economy besides the United States and its allies. We have a choice to make. What if all of this is prophesied of in Scripture? Let's go back over here. What are we going to see in the time of commotion and men's hearts failing them? An overflowing scourge and a desolating sickness. Now, I just showed you Genesis. Guess what desolating meant there? They don't go to war. In fact, let me take you back. Watch this. We'll do another search. I'd rather you see this with your own eyes than hear me say it from my mouth because it's so much more powerful here than it is from here. Where do you think the first time in Scripture is that money appears? Genesis also. We start to learn of these concepts of money. All right, let's see if I can find it. I think it's here. There it is. The desolating scourge in this day led to monetary failure. How many times do we think of that? When we think of the fat kind, the lean kind, Joseph saving everybody, including Egypt, how many times do we think, oh, the money failed? Well, that's what the desolation led to. So when President Hinckley gets up and says, hey, fat kind, lean kind, Seven years apiece times four, that's 28 years, 2001. And then comes this world organization in 2020 
19 years after that and says, by the way, we're going to collapse the world economy. You'll own nothing. You'll be happy. And we're going to do that in approximately 2029. We're going to call it the Great Reset. But don't worry. And don't worry. That's just a coincidence. So what do we do with that? Morgan, you, sure. What you're saying is the dollar is going to set. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. unless they do yeah. something yeah. to create place. Unless they do, so what, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into economics. I don't know them very well, but typically when you don't want your dollar to collapse, you do something to sustain it, which typically causes inflation. And then the inflation gets out of control and you can't contain it. And then you hyperinflate and then your economy collapses, even if you don't want it to. And so typically what people will try to do is introduce a new currency on top of the hyperinflating currency that is collapsing. Fortunately, we're not doing that, right? We're not doing that, right? <laughs> well, what do we call it? CBDC, the central bank digital currency. They're already implementing something to save the falling dollar. Yeah, it's not crypto. It is, it is a central, it's like central banking, like the Federal Reserve type thing, except digital. Okay, so why would this matter? Well, the Doctrine and Covenants um, isn't the only place where we learn about this overflowing scourge. Uh, there's somebody who comes along in the book of Isaiah and 2 Nephi 18, which is a mirror of Isaiah 8. And this person prophesied to arise in the last days is an overflowing power. Who is it? King of Assyria. And he, the king of Assyria, shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over, and he shall reach even to the neck. And the stretching out of his wings, what stretches out its wings? Some sort of bird. Where do we learn about a bird in the last days in Scripture? Ezra's eagle. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. What land is that? It's America. We learn that in Ether. The God of this land is Emmanuel, or like Ether says, Jesus Christ. This is not, he doesn't use Jehovah. Why? He could have said, thy land, O Jehovah. But he didn't. He purposefully used a word that is associated with Jesus, the Christ, as the Messiah, Emmanuel. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, the staff in their hand is their indignation. Whose hand? He doesn't say his hand. Whose hand? Ponder that one. Which is headquartered where? Washington, D.C., now, that's an uncomfortable truth. I know it's other places as well. D yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Jacoby Gath. What's Jacoby Gath? One of the cities that got destroyed. Rob K. does an amazing presentation on Jacoby Gath on his YouTube channel called The Mormon Yeshiva. He talks about what Ugat means and how it appears in the book of Abraham, or sorry, in, in Genesis, relative to the cakes that are baked by Abraham for the three heavenly visitors who also go and visit Lot. And in Lot's story, we learn that five cities are destroyed, kind of in this story of these cakes baked for the three. What does Gath also mean? Let's say it doesn't mean Ugat, cakes, Yaakov Ugat, Jacob's cakes. In the Book of Mormon, the five cities that lead to the complete destruction of the Nephite people. But where else do we find Gath? Please. Goliath, the giant. Okay, so, so you go study those stories and look at what happens in both of these stories. Now, let's go to some maybe less obvious things for some, obvious to some of you maybe. Jacob, where is Jacob today? Metaphorically speaking. It's in America. 
Okay, Jacob means the <coughs> supplanter. Who supplanted the people in America? Found the seed of Jacob, Ephraim and Manasseh. Right? They wiped off the Lamanites and the Lemuelites just as Lehi predicted they would in 2 Nephi chapter 1. 2 Nephi chapter 1 is directed at Laman and Lemuel. 2 Nephi 2 is directed at Jacob. 2 Nephi 3 is directed at Joseph. See anything in that order? Lamanites, Lemuelites, Jacobites, restoration of the gospel, house of Joseph, Joseph Smith, rise of Ephraim and Manasseh after that. So who is Jacob today? Jacob is America. What is Jacob? The supplanter. What happens if Jacob is not converted to the Lord to become Israel? What's President Nelson saying? Gather Israel. What do you do when you see the fullness of the Gentiles in Scripture? You go and join the house of Israel, because if you don't, what's going to happen to you? You'll be swept off the land. Okay, so Jacob, the supplanter, Jacob, you gath, all those who don't want to come unto the Lord, what's going to happen to them? Jacob is unconverted Israel. Jacob Goth is the city made by unconverted Israel, represented in the five cities that are fully destroyed in the Book of Mormon in 3 Nephi 8 through 10. So, if the rod of anger is in their hands, this is my own theory, you don't have to believe it, then where is he growing up in? He's a product of the United States of America. He rises up in our own nation. <laughs> no. He's the left hand of God. In contrast to the right hand of God, he is the wrath of God in contrast to the mercy and the peace and the Zion of God. So the Assyrian, his purpose is to do what? To go against a hypocritical nation, against the people of my wrath, those are the non-believers, the ones who don't convert, the ones who don't become Israel. I will give him charge to take the spoil, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Now, why is this important? Why would I go here? Because if you have a person that you believe is the prophet of God on the earth telling you, you live in this time, and you go to the scripture, which he footnotes himself, which takes you to an explanation of that exact time in which you live and unfolds a series of events that will come forward in your lifetime, because what does it say? There will be men standing in that generation that will not pass until they see an overflowing scourge and desolating sickness. Have you seen the desolating sickness already? A desolating sickness doesn't kill. It kills the economy. It causes your money to fail. When did you start to notice, to where you couldn't deny it anymore, that America's economy was purposefully being brought down? Gas prices at $4. Yeah, you couldn't deny it after 2020. Now, if you, maybe you can. I, I couldn't anymore. Who's the hypocritical nation? Nobody ever says otherwise. I've never been in a presentation where somebody thinks that that's somebody else. Why is that? So here we are. We're being basically, you know, President Nelson and, and any prophet of God cannot stand up in front of a people who are not willing to hear and tell them things plainly until what point in time? And how do you humble them when they won't do it themselves? Wrath. God pours out wrath. So if you go to general conference, I had a friend say to me once, general conference is called general for a reason. It's not called specific conference. Right? Because they got to speak to everybody at the level everybody can understand. And it's our duty to take that and go home to our families and dig deeper and prepare our families. Okay, 2 Nephi 10, this, 2 Nephi 20, this is Isaiah 10. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption, even determined in all the land. O oh, my people that dwellest in Zion, 
Be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod. So it doesn't say don't worry because he won't. The Lord's like, don't worry, he'll hit you. <laughs> you think it's going to be the opposite, right? Something comforting. The Assyrian, he shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while, the Lord of hosts, hosts shall stir up a scourge for him. According to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb, that's a turning of the tables. That was a brutal massacre, but it was a massacre carried out by the Israelites against other people. And here it's being turned on us, the Gentiles, and we are being told we will be slaughtered as they were. It's like a chiasmus, right? Coming, coming back around with kind of an opposite meaning. Look at 2 Nephi 27. He skips Isaiah 28. Okay, the, Nephi does not take Isaiah 28 and put it into the Book of Mormon. Instead, he goes straight to Isaiah 29. But guess what he does? He adds a verse that is not in Isaiah 29. It says, Behold, in the last days, or in the days of the Gentiles, they will be drunken with iniquity and all manner of abominations. Can you see from that now why Nephi does not put Isaiah 28 in? Because it's about that. Because it's about that. Isaiah 28 is about the drunkards of Ephraim, and they have limited space on the gold plates. So Nephi is taking care of Isaiah 28 by inserting a verse into Isaiah 29 in 2 Nephi 27 to basically say, hey, don't forget to go read Isaiah 28 which is about the drunkards of Ephraim who sit upon the fat valleys, who make a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. Okay, woe to the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim. The Lord hath a mighty and strong one as a tempest of hail and destroying storm. What if this is the antithesis of the mighty and strong one who sets in order the house of God, and this is the Assyrian. This is the mighty and strong left arm who the Lord will send to humble the hypocritical nation, the drunkards of Ephraim. Now, how many of you have watched the Chosen episodes and seen the one with the woman at the well? Where does Christ go to visit the woman at the well? Samaria. Samaria. We get more detail than that. It's a place in Samaria called, which is in the land of Sikar. Sikar means the drunkard. So we're in Samaria, which is the land of the Ephraimites and the other nine and the other, the 10 tribes, right? The, the two, Benjamin and Judah, remained in the southern kingdom of Judah. And the Lord gave Jeroboam as the new king of the northern kingdom of Israel power over the 10. He gave him 10 pieces of the cloth that's in the Old Testament. Sends him up to Samaria. Samaria becomes the capital. Jacob's well is in a place called Sakar. Sakar means the drunkard. The Lord visits with the woman at the well, goes into town and spends how long there? Two days. What year would that be that he's doing this? Just guess. Probably 80, 30 to 31, 32, 33. You know, I, I think 33 is pushing it. But I think that's probably better, 31. So he spends two days with the Samaritans, the lost 10 tribes or the northern 10 or the Gentiles. Two days, according to 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter says, if I could give you one piece of advice, never forget this. A day, a thousand years is as a day unto the Lord. So he spends two days. Remember Christ says, I did nothing but teach by parables, he told that to his disciples. So the New Testament is a great big book of parables. What if two days with the Gentiles is a parable? 2,000 years, 31 AD plus 2,000 equals? The great reset's coming. President Hinckley told us in 2001, 28 years. But that's just another coincidence. Okay, what's going to happen to these drunkards of Ephraim? 
who sit in modern Samaria, who are the modern seed of Jacob's well. Who did Jacob build the well for? Okay, I think if I'm remembering this right, wasn't it Rachel? Rachel's posterity is Joseph. So you're, you're living in the place that this is talking about right now. And you have a living prophet who says, you live in this time. Here's a footnote to help you get started on your journey to understanding this. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule the people which is in Jerusalem. Oh man, we're saved. You know why? He's not talking about us. He's talking about those people over on the other side of the ocean. Right? Because they deserve to be punished. Right? They're more enlightened than the LDS people are over there. Right? How can you make the argument that this is about over there? You can't. If you liken the scriptures unto yourselves, then ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Salt Lake City, Utah. You LDS people in Utah have made a covenant with death, and with hell are you in agreement. And when the overflowing scourge comes to Utah, you think it won't come to you because you've made lies your refuge and under falsehood have you hid yourselves. That's a lot more painful, right? And it's a lot more appropriate to read it that way. So who's the overflowing scourge coming from, for? Coming for us. What if it's already here? Has anybody looked at the border lately? It's already overflown. Now, what's interesting is Lehi teaches a principle to his sons that no one cometh unto this land except they are brought by the hand of God. Right hand or left hand? Because if it's the left hand bringing them, guess who's bringing them in? The Assyrian. For the purpose of the overflow and the scourge and the trotting down. If they're coming in with the right hand, it's part of that gathering of the house of Israel to the promised land. Yeah, the Lord repeats all this, which normally I go into, but I've done that in previous presentations, and so I've kind of shifted gears. And if I went into that tonight, like we'd be here till like two in the morning, because I am very long-winded. No. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Um, okay, so why does that footnote matter? Right, work, with all of this, let's go to DNC 45, 30 through 59. All we're doing, I, I'm, to save time, I'm not going to go there. You, you gotta, you'll just have to go look it up. With that footnote, we take this entire journey. So he says, you live in the days. Commotion, hearts failing. Now we take a journey from that time through the footnote, through all of these different references, and we find out that we live in the time spoken of. Um, now I'm going to take you back to Isaiah 28 real quick. I just want you to see that word, a consumption, determined. Let me show you what that means in Hebrew. I thought I had it. So maybe I've got it. I probably got it on a future slide. Let me just run through this real quick. Just notice these terms. A consumption determined, a desolating scourge, poured out from time to time. How many boosters do you have to get? No, I don't care what you did, right? That, I, I, have, I have no opinion on that. But it's hard to ignore that we now have a disease loose in the world that is evolving and requiring constant checkups and boosters to adapt to the evolving, desolating sickness that now has permeated the entire world. What's the purpose of these plagues poured out in the last days? If we don't read it kindly, it's to kill everyone who doesn't repent, right? Poured out if they repent not until the earth is empty. 
utterly destroyed by the brightness of the Lord's coming. So look at those words, overflowing scourge, desolating sickness, a scourge, a consumption, a desolating scourge, consumption decreed. All these words are found in these different Isaiah passages, Doctrine, Covenants passages, Book of Mormon passages. They're used by Daniel, Ezekiel, Joel, Matthew, John the Revelator, Nephi, and Joseph Smith. Daniel 9 in particular refers to a consummation stating, the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. So do you see the parallels? Daniel's kind of taken all of them, packaged them in a verse for a purpose. I'm not going to go through those verses, but notice the term, a consummation determined. DNC 87.6 says, A consumption decreed. Sound, sound similar? Consummation determined. Consumption decreed. That will be poured out upon the desolate. The Hebrew word for consummation in Daniel is kala, which means a full end and a consumption. Okay, that's the NC 87.6. The consumption decreed hath made a full end of all nations. Where does America fit into that picture? In the of it. Does all mean all? So what's America's choice right now? Repent or be destroyed. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but it's a really good study to do. Those who are destroyed are Gentiles. Those who are not are the house of Israel. over the New Testament. Gentiles, he say, love to exercise dominion over each other. They love to take advantage of each other. They love to hoard money. They love to build up their own kingdoms. They are hypocritical. They don't take care of widows and orphans. The, the Book of Mormon teaches you that Gentiles love secret combinations. house. It's Isaiah chapter 9 and 10, I think. So there's no room. They take up all the land. All right. I got to quit going off on these tangents. Daniel 9, 27. For the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate even to the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. So what is, you see the word he's using there. He's getting at the abomination of desolation. And DNC 8885 tells us what the desolation of abomination is. That their souls may escape the wrath of God. Insert synonym here, comma, the desolation of abomination. See, this makes it way easier. Now we know where to go to literally track the entire desolation of abomination. Where? It's the wrath of God. It's revelation. The seven vials filled up with the wrath of God. Okay, so we get to now, you see what these guys are doing. Remember that passage? Anybody serve a mission? Don't raise your hand. You can if you want, but you might be the only one. John the Revelator says, hey, nobody will add or take away from the book of Revelation. So you see what Daniel's doing and Joseph is doing and Nephi and Ezekiel. And Jeremiah, they're running as far up to the edge of the book of Revelation as they possibly can to give you hints to go there so that you can take what they tell you without intruding upon the book of Revelation, like the Lord told them not to. So when we look at these books from that perspective, when we realize that the book of Revelation is the capstone of the latter-day vision that no other prophet can touch, we can see that what they're trying to do is trying to get you to engage with that book using the hints and clues they give you to better interpret that book. If we take those hints and clues 
And we use these other prophets before we go into the book of Revelation. When we go into it, we can see it much more clearly and understand why Joseph Smith would say it was the clearest book that God ever caused to be written. If it's not the clearest book to you that God has ever written, which it is not to me, guess what that means? We all have some work to do. And the Lord's not going to magically pour it into your head because he's given you the work that you need to do to get there to better prepare yourself and your family for the latter days. So in Revelation, right, here it is, Revelation 15, 1, the wrath of God, according to DNC 8885, is a synonym to the desolation of abomination. And to understand the desolation of abomination, it's going to come in waves Seven metaphorical waves turned into vials starting in Revelation 16 or 15. I can't remember where. I think the first one's in 16. We'll get there tonight, I hope. And what time is it? Because we need to break for dessert. 7.05? All right, let's try 7.30. Is that okay for a break? Okay, so, so how, do we, how do we do this, right? How do we start taking these different guys and getting into a place where instead of the gospel being the thing you learned about in primary, right? Um, Jesus said, love everyone, treat them kindly too. When your heart is filled with love, others will love you. And so we spend our whole life trying to be kind, and that is good. But that was a primary song that was intended to teach you about other deeper doctrines that we were supposed to explore as we grow older. Okay, Daniel 10, 14. Here's the purpose. Daniel is being given this, a series of visions to understand what shall befall the people in the latter days, his people, the children of Israel, the house of Israel. Daniel is not only shown what will be, but he is given an explanation of, the most, of most things and a set of formulaic numbers that will be relevant to the first and second coming of Christ. These prophetic visions and numbers will reveal latter-day events and lead up to the coming of Adam, the Ancient of Days, to Adam on Diamond in preparation for the second coming. We learn this in Daniel. I beheld until what? The Ancient of Days did sit. Where does he sit? We learn that in DNC 116. He sits on a hill called Adam on Diamond in Missouri. So let's start at the beginning and try to see what Daniel's trying to prepare us for. Now, I'm not going to go into some of this, partially because we don't have time and partly because I don't understand some of this. I see the surface of it, but I don't know how to penetrate the mystery of the thing. Among these children of Judah, this is Daniel 1, are four kids, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, why would the prophet Daniel take up extra space to tell you his Babylonian name. Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, uh, Me, sorry, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Belteshazzar. Daniel means a judge is God. Hananiah, Yah has been gracious. Mishael, who is like unto God. Azariah, helped by God. Now look at the Babylonian names. Baal, protect the king. Shadrach, the command of Aku, the god of the moon or the servant of sin. Meshach, the guest of a king. Abednego, worshiper of mercury or a more natural interpretation according to one is servant of splendor or servant of the sun, which in Babylon would be Tammuz or Tammuz's father through immaculate conception through Tammuz's mother who murdered his father and then told everybody that he was immaculately conceived by the sun, so they would worship him as a god. That's not a positive thing. So why put that? Daniel 1 says, They were children in whom was no blemish, and they had the ability to stand in the king's palace. They were nourished three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now, does that ring any bells? Four who sit next to the throne of God. Look at the book of Revelation in chapter 4. Before the throne, you got four who are able to stand at the throne of God, stand in the presence of the king. Which ones, the Baal ones or the Israelite ones? The Israelite names. 
are the pure. They stand before the throne. There was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the phone, throne were four beasts full of eyes. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. What if Daniel is trying to connect you to the book of Revelation and those four beasts? He's teaching you a lesson. And he's teaching you a lesson of the cosmos. Why? How many of you followed the sign in 2017 of Virgo? Okay, why would, who doesn't know about that? I'm like kind of hoping nobody raised their hand. <laughs> but it's, um, it was the Revelation 12 sign where Virgo up in space turns into Revelation 12 quite literally. And then a Catholic scholar gets online and he writes, this doesn't mean Jesus is coming. Because all the Christians were like, it's a sign, Jesus is coming. So this Catholic scholar who works for the Vatican Observatory gets online and says, no, it doesn't mean that it happened before. It happened in September of 1827. <laughs> like, thank you for that information. That's when Joseph Smith got the gold plates. Same time, when that appeared last. Here it is again in 2017. Why would Daniel want to connect you to the book of Revelation? You know, in the book of Revelation, it says that Christ holds seven stars in his hand, the seven churches. What's the constellation that has the seven women? Pleiades, which is also mentioned in the Old Testament. Now, I think I have a theory on why Daniel does this. This is God's cosmic picture. This is the zodiac, the perverted picture. Astrology, witchcraft, sorcery, right? So occasionally in the book of Daniel, we're going to hear these names and these names. And I think that's for a purpose. And if you're smarter than me, let me know when you figure that out because I haven't been able to figure it out yet. <coughs> Okay, now in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, why would Daniel put that? Right in Daniel 1, the very first thing he tells you is that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, comes to Jerusalem and besieges it. What if I put that in modern terms and liken it unto myself? In the third year of the reign of a modern governor of Utah, the king of Babylon came to Salt Lake City and took it over. And the Lord gave the governor of Utah into the hand of the king of Babylon. That seems more pertinent to my day. So let's do that. So I'll do this quick because some of you have seen this. 1958, National Geographic publishes an article called Geographical Twins, A World Apart. In that magazine, in 1958, they publish a picture of the Jordan River in Utah next to the Jordan River in Israel. The Great Salt Lake next to the Dead Sea. A map of Israel with a fresh body of water, 60-mile Jordan River, and a Great Salt Lake. And then they post a map of Utah with a fresh body of water, a 60-mile river, and a Great Salt Lake. One with the capital city of a holy people. The other one with the capital city of a holy people. And they call these geographical twins. Now, in the ancient southern kingdom of Judah, there were 20 kings. Rehoboam being the first, this is when he splits from Jeroboam, and Jeroboam takes charge of the northern kingdom, and Rehoboam takes charge of the southern kingdom. These are the governors of Utah lined up in order with the ancient kings of the southern kingdom of Judah. The yellow one is where we are today. Number 18. What happens at number 20 in the Book of Mormon? Jerusalem. Jerusalem is sieged. Zedekiah's children are killed in front of his face. He's carried away to Babylon, but Lehi, being guided by the Lord, leaves 13 years earlier 
and saves his family from the destruction of Jerusalem. Why would this matter? 2 Nephi 12, it shall come to pass in the last days when the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. There's Jacob again. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Speaking of Isaiah 2, President Hinckley stated in 2000, I believe that prophecy applies to the historic, wonderful Salt Lake Temple, but I believe that it is related to this magnificent hall. This is the dedication of the conference center, for it is from this pulpit that the law of God shall go forth together with the word and testimony of the Lord. Now let's read that again. It shall come to pass in the last days when the mountain of the Lord's house, the temple, shall be established in Utah and shall be exalted above all the hills, little nations and other countries, and all nations shall flow to Utah, to the temple. And how many do we have now? They're all over. And many people shall go and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of America shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Salt Lake City. Ether 13, I, Moroni, proceed to finish my record concerning the destruction of the people who, of whom I have been writing. For behold, they rejected all the words of Ether, for he truly told them that after the waters had receded from off the face of this land, it became a choice land above all other lands, that it was the place of the new Jerusalem. You all know where that's at, right? Where? Jackson County, which should come down out of heaven. Behold, Ether saw the days of Christ, and he spake concerning a new Jerusalem upon this land. He spake also concerning the house of Israel and the Jerusalem from whence Lehi should come. Where's that? It's over in the Middle East. And it should be destroyed and built up again. There's the captivity and the exiles. Ezra goes back. They build it up again. When Christ comes, Jerusalem is there again. It's the holy city of the Lord. He comes to it and they kill him there. Wherefore, and it's holy, why? Because that's where he makes his holy sacrifice and is anointed for that sacrifice. Wherefore, the remnant of the house of Joseph shall be built upon this land, and it shall be a land of their inheritance, and they, the remnant of Joseph, shall build a holy city under the Lord like under the Jerusalem of old. Where's that? You might say it's the new Jerusalem, but look what he says in 10. And then cometh the new Jerusalem. So what are we doing in verse 8? Salt Lake City, Utah. Ether and Moroni both prophesy of Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay, let's go back to this image. Now it's starting to get really uncomfortable. Because not only are there these prophecies very explicit, which reference Salt Lake City, and let me give you one more, the word Zarahemla, Zarahemla, Zara, princess, seed, stake, had the breath of God infused into this place, the holy anointing upon this people, Mala, salt. Ouch. Even the Book of Mormon prophesies of Salt Lake City, right? The capital city of the Nephites, Zarahemla, the capital city of the modern Latter-day Saints. Salt Lake City, Utah. So here we are. Uh, say this. Anybody want to try that? I actually don't agree with the Jews. I know I'm wrong. It's not pronounced Yehuda. It's pronounced Judah. They changed it to associate themselves with Jehovah, who they killed. They don't get to claim it anymore until they repent of that and fix their ways. That's Judah. Where's modern Judah? Now, who gave us that name? The Mormons picked it because they were planning a grand conspiracy that would roll out at the end of days, right? No, it was the federal government. It was the anti-Mormons who gave us the name Utah. They wouldn't let us call it Deseret, so they made us take the name Utah, which in Hebrew would be Judah, or in uh, Apache and Ute language is the people up on high or at the top of the mountains, just like Isaiah said. Um, uh, my daughter's calling me. Give me 
<laughs> oh, shoot. Just give me a sec. Okay, we can't break here either. Hey, make it quick. I'm in a presentation. <laughs> oh, you gotta be kidding me. Okay, so hold on. You can't argue with a cop. Call, call mom. Just call mom. Okay. Love you. Bye. Right oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, it's two other kids. <laughs> their friend's car went into the river. So they went to pick up their friends, but a cop came and took the one kid whose car it was into the cop car. And they're like, we think we should take him. And I'm like, don't argue with the cops. Call mom. <laughs> Let them take him. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Now remember, this is where we started. The third year of the reign of Jehoiakim. Who's Jehoiakim? There's our Jehoiakim. He comes from our county. Comes from Fairview. Yeah, he comes from this county. He matches up perfectly. Okay, so now why why would that matter? Well, watch. What would be the third year of his reign? Close. First year of his reign is 2021. Second year of his reign is 2022. Third year of his reign is 2023. Okay, now, I'm not saying this means anything. I don't know what it means. I just like to point out interesting corollaries. 2023, on March 2nd, 2023, we got a new flag. Coincidence? Maybe. The third year of his reign, we adopted that. Well, not quite yet. That's all, of course, until this year. That's right. But this is when it was it is, it it was voted on and passed in 2023. The only way you stop that is if you repeal it, and it's not repealed. Okay, there it is. Now that's what they wanted. This is what they got. What they wanted was Venus. Or, that's the star of Ishtar, who was the queen of Babylon, whose colors were blue and gold. That's just a coincidence, though. The name of the statewide initiative, more than just a flag, this is not me, this is on uh, the Utah government's flag website. The name of the statewide initiative, more than just a flag, signifies its greater purpose. After an extensive public engagement campaign throughout 2022, the proposed new design aims to represent Utah's shared values now. What are those values? Well, I mean, that's obvious. This is the land of the LDS people. There's one word we as LDS people would never use for a flag because we all love Ezra Tapp Benson. Oh, darn it. They used it anyway. <laughs> The purpose of our new flag is to show that Utah loves pride. And how many of you know that's absolutely not true? Why would we do This is the Utah government's official website. In the same year, third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, who just so happens to match up with our current governor, in the large and spacious building which thy father saw as vain imaginations of pride of the children of men. Came to pass, I saw and bear record that the great and spacious building was the pride of the world, and it fell, and the fall thereof was exceedingly great. So what happens when a country comes in and conquers another country? You raise a new flag. I don't know what happened in 2000. Well, I mean, I know what happened in 2020. We laundered $100 billion through the state of Utah in the name of COVID. And now here we are in 2024. It's not really 2024. I'll show that in a second. And we've adopted a new flag as a symbol of pride, which pride is the heart of everything we have learned in scripture about Babylon. We LDS people are really good at spiritually metaphorizing 
everything. Spiritually metaphorize that and contemplate that we may have just been spiritually conquered and adopted a new flag that represents the opposite of everything we've ever been taught in the Doctrine and Covenants, including by President Benson, who said the condemnation still rested upon us, that the Lord put upon us in the Doctrine and Covenants. All right, let's stop there and have some treats and come back in about, in fact, let's grab them, take about 10 minutes and come back. Well, come on, we have a... Uh... Water and drinks, just circle around here and bathroom.